Okay, so this is uh, another short introductory video to kind of introduce you to one of the topics in, that's going to be covered in the second lecture, kind of just to get you up to speed in some of the, the basics um, in how weathering and climate interact. Okay, so this is uh, an image that, you know, some of you that have uh, been on maybe geography field trips may be familiar with. This is some uh, chemical weathering going on here of limestone. So you can see the, the solution weathering uh, this uh, this landscape here, and you might think that there's uh, there's a relationship here between kind of weathering and climate. So we might get more weathering uh, when there is uh, more precipitation, or maybe a warmer climate, or more acid rain, or something like that. So there's a link between the kind of the, the climate and what happens in terms of weathering, but there's also a link the other way around, okay? So the weathering also has an impact on climate, okay? And that's what this video will, will show um, uh, and, and, and talk you through some of the chemistry uh, behind the reasons for this. Okay, and so from the first lecture, you'll be familiar with this equation up here. Okay, so this is the surface temperature equation. So we've got, just to remind you, this is the, the solar flux, so the amount of incoming solar radiation. This term is the albedo, Boltzmann constant, that's a constant, that won't change. And then there's this term, emissivity, or absorptivity of the atmosphere. Okay, so weathering might, well, weathering is not going to change the power of the sun, it might change the colour of the landscape a little bit, uh, but uh, the big impact is on this term, emissivity. Okay, so what we're going to be doing here is showing how weathering actually changes the CO2 content of the atmosphere. Okay, that'll make this number here bigger. Okay, because the atmosphere will be more uh, absorptive because there's more CO2 in it. Okay, which will make the bottom of the term in this equation uh, smaller because this is a minus here. And if we make the bottom of this equation smaller, the whole thing will get bigger, so the temperature will go up. Okay. So we're also going to look at kind of this effect of uh, precipitations of things in the ocean. And you might kind of like to think of that this as kind of a little bit like reverse weathering. Um, so this is kind of where we're taking uh, chemicals that have been weathered from rocks, they've been dissolved into a uh, solution, and then they're precipitated out back into minerals into the ocean. So we've got uh, copper lithophores up here, these are foraminifera, some shells and corals, these are all made of some form of calcium carbonate. And we'll see what effect that these have on um, the atmospheric CO2 content and therefore also on the climate. Okay. So this is the kind of, uh, kind of take home message really, this is the kind of the answer in that we've got this process that happens kind of mostly on land uh, where rocks interact with water and carbon dioxide uh, and this weathering process happens and forms lots of dissolved ions, okay, uh, calcium, silicon, uh, and bicarbonate in this case. And that's, this process takes up CO2, okay. These things go into the ocean and then they precipitate out as shells uh, um, in the ocean, okay. So we're going to have a look at a little bit of the detail of this process, these processes in fact. So this is one of the lectures from the slide, from the, this is one of the slides from the lecture in fact, and it's a bit horrible, uh, lots of stuff on here. So uh, we're just going to go through bit by bit this slide to kind of explain what's going on in each of these kind of series of chemical uh, equations, chemical equilibria. Okay, so we've got, uh, first of all, what happens when carbon dioxide dissol dissolves in water, and then we've basically got two cases of, of weathering reactions, one of carbonate rocks and one of silicate rocks, and that pretty much describes all of the weathering that, ha that happens on Earth, um, to an approximation anyway. So the first set of equations, uh, carbon dioxide dissolving in, in water, so basically carbon dioxide gas, Okay, that will dissolve in water, like any other gas will dissolve in water. Okay, uh, but rather than just being CO2 molecules surrounded by water molecules, okay, floating around, there's actually a chemical reaction that happens where the CO2 reacts with the water to form this substance here, which is called carbonic acid. Okay, and these are equilibrium reactions, so these go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Um, and this carbonic acid is a very unstable molecule in water. Okay, so that breaks apart very, very rapidly to uh, this compound here, which is uh, bicarbonate, 
okay and that releases a hydrogen ion and then that compound then in turn also can break apart into carbonate ion which is this guy here and a hydrogen ion okay so the important thing here is that when we have uh, uh, co2 dissolving in, in water it basically creates these compounds down at the bottom okay it releases hydrogen ions, okay? So by adding CO2 to water, we produce some hydrogen ions. We produce mostly, it turns out that the, the, the reactions don't all go to completion. There's an equilibrium between them. And in, in, terms, of, in terms of the ocean in particular, we've mostly got this species here, uh, bicarbonate present, okay? Um, the other thing is that this 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 reaction here, this this compound here, is so unstable that it's, there's almost none of it um, available in water. So you can kind of think as this the concentration of this compound to be equivalent. You can just basically add the, con the concentration of CO two and carb carbonic acid together and just call those kind of one thing. Okay, so you can think of as if you have a reaction that removes uh, carbonic acid. You can think of that as just removing CO2, okay? But with these guys over here, if you remove um, uh, bicarbonate, you're not directly removing CO2. You have to go through these series of reactions. Okay, so we just go through the weathering of carbonate rocks. Okay, so the, the, we've got the top, we've got calcium carbonate. Okay, so this is kind of limestone. Uh, and that reacts mostly in soils, in fact, with this carbonic acid. So it's actually just CO2 and water, basically, reacting together with um, carbonic, uh, with calcium carbonate, sorry. And that basically dissolves, okay, so it's essentially just a dissolution reaction uh, to form calcium ions and uh, bicarbonate ions, okay? So that's, that's the weathering reaction, but those things um, end up going into the water. Okay, so that's that's the weathering of carbonate, and you can see that there that that removes one basically one for every one molecule of calcium carbonate, we're removing one uh, carbonic acid, which is basically the same as removing one CO two. Okay, because this 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 happens relatively speedy, speedily even. Okay, but when these ions that we've dissolved, once these get into the ocean, okay, we precipitate calcium carbonate. Okay. And it turns out that if you take calcium, you take uh, bicarbonate ions, okay, which is the dominant form of carbon in the ocean, uh, and react those two together, we, we form again calcium carbonate. So this is the kind of thing that forms corals and uh, uh, shells and coccolis and things like that. Actually, fish poo is, uh, contains a lot of calcium carbonate. Uh, and uh, that reaction actually releases carbon dioxide. Okay, so it's not uh, so intuitive, but actually by removing um, calcium carbonate from the ocean, so we're precipitating out essentially sediments that are made of carbon, that actually adds carbon back into the water. Okay, and because the water is in equilibrium with the atmosphere, this adds CO2 to the atmosphere. Okay, so overall, okay, so the weathering of carbonate rocks removes one CO2 for every kind of mole of rock. Uh, but releases one mole of CO2 for every mole of carbonates that's produced. So over the long geological time scales, okay, these two things are kind of in balance. Okay? So the more weathering we do, the more ions accumulate in the ocean, and that promotes more, uh, more precipitation of, of basically biogenic carbonates. Okay? So over very long time scales, this effect these effects cancel out so weathering of carbonate rocks over long time scales does do not really affect atmospheric co2 over short time scales you could have maybe have an imbalance between weathering and maybe something more weathering that would draw down co2 but then eventually precipitation would, would catch up over many um tens of thousands of years okay so carbonate rocks it tends to cancel out okay so let's look at um the silicate weathering Okay, so we're going to simplify all silicate rocks to this kind of chemical formula here, which I think is actually the chemical formula for perovskite, but that doesn't really matter. But it's some mineral that's got silicon in, it's got some other ions in as well, and some oxygen. Okay, 
And it turns out to whether, and this is actually a, a fairly good um, kind of approximation of, of silicate rock kind of chemistry. Okay, it would have some magnesium and some iron in, but that's not so, not so important. Um, it turns out that this weathering reaction is slightly different. So this uh, takes CO2 and water. So this, you know, could be thought as that carbonic acid again. Okay, um, and it produces ions. Okay, so it produces um, calcium ions, it produces bicarbonate ions, it produces silicic acid, which is kind of a, actually some of this is kind of in ionic form as well, but this is also a dissolved um, form of silica. Okay, and that removes um, uh, two CO2s, okay, for every one mole of uh, silicate rock, okay. So when these things, when these ions get to the ocean, when these go into the ocean, okay, the silicate, okay, ooh, there we go, uh, the silica, uh, that precipitates out as um, uh, opal, so diatoms, um, radiolaria, kind of organisms that produce silica shells. Uh, and again, the calcium and the bicarbonate, similarly say exactly the same reactions for, this produces a calcium carbonate shell or skeleton and releases CO2. Okay, but The difference here is that the weathering reaction of silicate rocks has removed two carbon dioxides, two carbon dioxides for every, essentially every one calcium, okay, or every one mole of rock, two moles of CO2 have gone, uh, but when we precipitate in the ocean we only re-release again, okay, we only release one mole of CO2. So in this case, over very long time scales, okay, these are not in balance. So we, we basically, over long time scales, if we weather silicate rocks, we are removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Okay, if we remove CO2 from the atmosphere, we're going to end up with a cooling. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the difference between weathering silicate rocks and weathering um, carbonate rocks. Weathering silicate rocks matter over the long term time scale, whereas weathering, weathering carbonate rocks doesn't matter. Uh, but on short time scales, both matter because you're, the precipitation in the ocean and the weathering on land are not necessarily in balance. But that's a, that's a caveat. Okay, so I mean, why does this matter in terms of controlling the climate? So this is the reaction at the top here that kind of matters. This is the chemical weathering reaction for silicate rocks we've just described. And like almost all chemical reactions, okay, when it's hot, uh, this reaction will will. Will, re will go faster, the reaction rate increases with temperature, and you'll cover that with, uh, with Brian in the environmental chemistry uh, part of the course. And also, you'll notice that these weathering reactions you know, involve water, okay? So we need water to dissolve rocks, okay? So when it's hot and it's wet, okay, we'll have more chemical weathering of silicate rocks, okay? And as it turns out, when the Earth's climate is generally hotter, okay, there's more energy in the climate system, okay, more water evaporates from the ocean, so we increase the hydrological cycle. So when it gets when the when the when the planet is warm, the planet is also tend to be tends to be wet. So how does this kind of like affect what happens to the climate? Okay, so we're going to go over in, in the lecture this concept of feedbacks in the climate system, uh, but I just thought I'd mention it here because it is really relevant to weathering. Okay, so we'll just go through what would happen, okay, if we say had some initial change, okay, so we maybe changed the solar flux, or maybe we had some forcing that changed uh, the albedo, or some other thing that changed, uh, maybe increase in atmospheric CO2 by some reason. Uh, uh, we maybe warm the planet, okay, so this is this, this example here. So we've got initial warming, okay. Okay, and the effect that that will have on weathering is that we, we basically we warm the planet, so we've got an increased temperature. We increase the amount of um, water. Okay, that will also increase the vegetation, so that'll increase the kind of the acids in the soil and stuff like that. But that's that's um, that's a kind of like a secondary effect. Um, so all of these things will combine to increase the rate of chemical weathering of silicate rocks. Okay, that will act to remove more and more CO two from the atmosphere which will have the effect of, of basically reducing uh, the, um, the emissivity or the absorptivity of the atmosphere. Okay, so that will go back into that equation for the uh, temperature of the, the surface of the Earth. Okay, so that will reduce the warming. Okay, so this is a negative feedback. So what we're doing is uh, we start off with some initial forcing that makes it warmer. 
okay but the weathering okay r reduces that initial warming okay okay so it's not just that the, the so the feedback is not that it it makes something warmer or makes something colder it's what it acts on the basically the sign positive or negative relative to the initial change so in this case we've reduced the initial change and that works as well with an initial cooling okay so if we cool um, the planet we reduce the temperature it gets drier we reduce our chemical weathering okay so we're taking less co2 out of the atmosphere okay so that means all of the other fluxes of, of co2 okay will lead to an increase in co2 in the atmosphere because we're removing less okay so that that means that we'll have more co2 in the atmosphere than we would have otherwise had and our initial cooling of the climate is somewhat counteracted by this reduction in weathering and increase in atmospheric CO2. Okay, so we'll go over more of this in the lecture, but this is just to give you kind of a little taster and hopefully we'll have uh, introduced you at least to the, the chemicals, chemical reactions that go on and cause um, there to be a feedback in um, uh, changes in climate uh, due to weathering and that uh, not only the um, weathering affects, sorry, the climate affects weathering rates, but also weathering rates affect the climate.